So, uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you all for joining us today to uh, this session on drones and uh, unlocking the lower skies as a uh, resource for mobility. My name is Catalina Ochoa and I'm a senior transfer specialist with the World Bank. I'm also the lead on the World Bank side for the African Drone Forum, which is uh, a, a platform uh, aimed at uh, accelerating the drone ecosystem in Africa. And it does so by convening, by bringing together the drone community like we're doing today. Also uh, by generating, disseminating and curating knowledge around uh, drones, drone technology and drone, drone policy, drone regulation. And also by advising governments that want to set up high frequency drone services uh, with high um, social impact. So um, I think we're ready to start. And uh, the question that uh, probably you all have in your minds is uh, why are we here today? What are we going to talk about today? And we're here because there is a real opportunity for drones to be a transformational force across the globe, particularly when it comes to Africa and uh, when it comes to, um, to the pandemic that we're currently living. So I'm very pleased to share the stage, or maybe I should say the screen, which this incredible uh, group of experts that from very different angles are looking as to what is the role that drones can play in supporting uh, this pandemic relief and we will hear today from uh, the investment funds that are looking at this technology very closely and seeing how is it evolving see the serious technology we would also look at this from the perspective of the impact investors who want to see this technology applied in the humanitarian space and we will also discuss uh, with the government on their perspective how can we make this happen and how can we make this happen faster and safer and finally, we would hear from the technology companies. We would hear from those that are building this technology. And we would hear from those that are building the business models in the ground to deploy this technology at scale. So without further ado, let's uh, start. Um, and we're going to start with Tasha. I feel so privileged to have in our panel uh, Tasha Kini from ARK Invest. And ARK Invest is a global asset management uh, firm and uh, that focuses on disruptive technologies. And uh, Tasha, within ARK Invest, she leads their autonomous technology and robotics team. And you have probably seen Tasha on TV. <laughs> uh, she's often in uh, CNN, yeah. on CNBC or Bloomberg, uh, speaking about the future of drones or the future, or the future of uh, electric vehicles or where the uh, stock price of Tesla would be. So I'm sure uh, she's a familiar face to many, to many of you. And, uh, and Tasha, thank you so much for joining us today. I want us to walk uh, to walk us through uh, through a very simple question that I'm still I'm sure it's still in a lot of people's mind. And this question is: uh, Are drones toy planes for adults, or is drone is the drone industry really taking off and becoming a game changer when it comes to cargo delivery? So, Tasha, the floor is yours. I'm really excited to to hear your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Catalina. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question in short and say, uh, you know, that, that drones are here today and, and we think they're, you know, one of the most exciting applications of autonomous technology and, and energy storage um, and, you know, broader AI um, that, that we see happening in the world today. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about drone delivery. I'm going to share some of the research that, that we've done at ARC on the space. Um, you know, before I start, it, it, for those of you that aren't familiar with ARC, um, you know, as Catalina mentioned, we're an investment firm. Uh, we, we focus right now on the public equity markets and on disruptive technology. Um, and as part of our investment process, we do a lot of original research on the technology platforms that we cover. Uh, we publish all of that research online, so it's free and open and available to the public. Um, and I'm so excited to share some of that with you all today. Um, we're a financial services firm, so I'm, I'm showing you all this disclosure slide. There's some risks of investing in innovation uh, that you should be aware of, uh, just to note. Um, so, you know, to kick it off, uh, today I'm going to talk about drone delivery and um, this, the reason that we think that this is such a dramatic transformation to happen uh, to, you know, how both people and goods uh, will, will get around is because, uh, you know, drone delivery is extremely inexpensive and it's extremely convenient. 
um, you know, it's something that's that's possible today, and uh, it, it's a very exciting technology because it can be a leapfrogging technology. Um, we're seeing that in the the developing world, these are actually the, some of the first applications of of more widespread dr uh, drone use. Both because you know regulators have been a little bit more amenable uh, to allowing drones to to take to the skies, um, and because uh, you know this is a, a very convenient technology for when uh, there is a lack of infrastructure. Um, so again, you can get that sort of leapfrogging effect. Uh, we think that we've seen, for instance, in uh, cell phones and, and other industries. Um, so you know why is this happening today? Well, uh, in our work, we've we've done a uh, we've taken a deep look at um, battery technology and autonomous technology and it's really the convergence of these two that that allows you know uh, autonomous air travel to be possible um, so batteries are declining in price um, they're uh, combined with autonomous technology they're allowing for a proliferation of form factors of different machines um, that can move autonomously uh, powered by batteries um, you know, this is one example here in the uh, the larger form factor drone space and drones that could actually transport people. Uh, you know, we, we just got to a point in, in battery technology where you have the additional flight reserve uh, that's needed to safely uh, pick a person up in an autonomous drone. And then on the uh, autonomous technology side, uh, this graph that you're looking at here shows um, the difference between uh, the cost of a 10 mile drone delivery if it were to be remotely piloted uh, versus autonomous. Um, you know, this is really, it's, it's driven by labor costs. So, so this could differ uh, country to country, of course. Um, but you can see that autonomous technology offers this really dramatic uh, reduction in price. Um, so in fact, this is so uh, valuable, so, so inexpensive. Um, it can totally change how people and goods get around. Um, and we think that logistics in general will be a much more important piece of the value chain across industries. And in fact, those companies that deliver um, autonomous drone delivery uh, could actually become you know, the most important piece of the industry that they're a part of in some cases. So here's a couple examples of, of what we're seeing in, in terms of you know, that, that um, inexpensive and, and very fast and convenient delivery. Um, you, know, you can see this graph here on pharmaceutical delivery. Of course, uh, you know, drones can, can get something to you in a matter of minutes um, versus uh, mail, which could take you know, days, weeks. Um, but it's also actually even faster than, than you getting it yourself in some cases. Um, and again, this is a case where in, in the developing world, you know, we see these dynamics um, are even more dramatic. So uh, we know that um, a zip line, for instance, in Rwanda um, can get you something in a matter of minutes uh, versus a trip that might even take three days on a motorbike. And uh, you know, this isn't just for, for goods, it's, it's also for people, as I mentioned. So for an eVTOL, which is an electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, craft, you know, we think that um, these could actually price similar to, to what taxis price at today um, in the future when this is fully commercialized. Um, and so again, it'll offer you a much faster um, option than, than traditional transportation and um, you know, can come at, at a price that's actually more, uh, less expensive than helicopters today. Um, so looking uh, you know, a bit deeper at that sort of uh, larger form factor drone that can deliver people, this can be uh, really dramatic in the healthcare space. Um, so you can picture a purpose-built vehicle um, that is an air ambulance um, you know, that can, can transfer a person, an EMT, uh, on spot to help someone. Um, every year globally, uh, nearly 7 million people suffer from cardiac arrest. Um, in the US, only 12% of the people that have those cardiac arrests outside of hospitals survive. And actually in the developing world, those survival rates can approach zero. Um, and here's an example where time really matters uh, for a response. So you can see the graph here, you know, survival rate dramatically improves um, the faster someone gets care. So um, an electric air ambulance could, could offer uh, those services much, much quicker and um, can make a very dramatic impact on, uh, you know, the, the, the quality of care that, that's received and of course uh, the survival rate, uh, which is really that crucial component um, in this case. Um, We've done some work looking at drones uh, across other industries. Uh, these are the, the smaller form factor drones that can offer us delivery of items. Um, here we've taken a look at e-commerce. We think that drones could deliver um, a meaningful share of our parcels in the next 10 years. Um, e-commerce as a percentage of retail today globally is about 18%. Um, you know, of course, that was accelerated by the coronavirus. Um, we see that approaching 60% in the next 10 years. 
And droughts could actually deliver over half of that volume. Um, and in this case, you can picture delivery um, in areas where uh, previously it really wasn't feasible or uh, those options would just take much longer and again, be much more expensive um, than these drone services. Uh, so we think that the global parcel drone delivery revenue uh, could, could approach over 100 billion in the next 10 years. Looking at food delivery, um, you know, I, I mentioned in the beginning, this is this is one case where actually, you know, maybe the, the food delivery apps that exist today may not be as valuable as those drone delivery platforms of the future, because um, that's what's really going to deliver the most value to this industry. It's going to help expand food delivery dramatically um, than it would than it otherwise would expand on its own. Um, and it'll, it'll offer, you know, that extremely competitive price point. Uh, so we, we think the, those companies could could really be a meaningful part of this world. Um, Today, food delivery as a percentage of food away from home is about 2%. We think that could approach 40% um, roughly by 2030. And again, uh, the additional share gain with drones in this industry is pretty meaningful um, because you're making delivery uh, possible in, in areas where uh, you know it just wasn't previously feasible. So we think that uh, global food delivery revenue from drones could approach, again, over 100 billion in the next 10 years. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about one more technology that we look at at ARC that's crucial for this industry, and that's 3D printing. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with 3D printing, it's a form of additive manufacturing. So you're building a part layer by layer as opposed to subtractive, where you have a big block of material. You cut away of it to make your part. Um, when you manufacture this way, you can you can make things very quickly on demand in hours, um, where the traditional manufacturing process might take weeks or even months to scale up to make. Uh, when you're in, working in low volumes, you can do things very cost effectively. And ultimately, you can create these architectures that were previously unmanufacturable. Uh, so you're creating parts that were never before possible and much better designed for what they're actually supposed to do. Uh, this was used a lot during uh, the, the pandemic for um, making replacement parts. 3D printing is great for all forms of replacement parts. Um, and in fact, I know the World Bank has some, some experience in that as well, um, sort of see, seeing the power of that. Uh, uh, nasal swabs, for instance, were another area where it would have just taken, you know, weeks or even months um, to get this going with traditional manufacturing methods. So actually, a lot of that ended up being 3D printing pr printed just because we needed them now. Um, so 3D printing is a leapfrogging technology, and uh, particularly again in the developing world, uh, you you can see this happen where you you instead of perhaps importing a part, um, it now would be cost effective to to manufacture it locally, and you wouldn't need a large scale factory to do so. You would just need um, you know this 3D printer, and and it's much more cost effective uh, to do that. 3D printing is allowing um, you know innovation across industries, but it's particularly important um, for anything that's aerial because these tend to be lower volumes, they tend to be highly complex parts, um, and 3D printing can allow you to uh, reduce the amount of material that you use and actually switch materials because of those new architectures that you can create. So in that case, um, you can reduce your fuel usage significantly. Um, so that really matters for drones and all types of aircraft. Um, so we think 3D printing is perfect for this industry. Um, and you know, across all drone applications, we think the hardware revenues uh, for things that roll and fly, um, that are autonomous, uh, could total uh, roughly 100 billion um, in the next 10 years. And you know, looking at those those three example industries that I talked about today, the, the parcel, food delivery, and air taxi spaces, um, you know, we think that the delivery revenues off of those in the next five years could reach 50 billion, hardware sales 14 billion, and 3 billion in mapping revenues. Um, so you know, I, I know all of you that are familiar with drones know that this is uh, mapping is a, a crucial uh, layer here uh, to to really building the infrastructure and making drone flight possible. Um, and uh, you know, we we think again, this is this is one of the most dramatic trans, uh, transformations that we've seen happen in the logistics space, um, and it can totally change how uh, we interact, how how we get around, and how we get our things delivered. Um, so it's really making what was previously impossible uh, possible today. And I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tasha. These are quite uh, imp 
predictive uh, numbers. I, I think you can stop uh, sharing your screen now. Um, and uh, and uh, it actually what Tasha shows is that drones would completely transform business models and, and, and the consumption patterns around the globe. But we also now live in unprecedented times and organizations uh, like the Gates Foundation have taken on the monumental challenge of ensuring equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. So I want to bring David in because as a senior program officer at the Gates Foundation, David has been working uh, towards uh, supporting innovations that strengthen supply chains uh, for health uh, products, including vaccines. So the question for you, David, today is, uh, first of all, how big of a challenge is delivering 1.2 billion vaccines by the end of the year for 92 countries? And the second one is, what role do you see drone technology playing on this challenge? Thank you so much, uh, Catalina, and uh, wow, Tasha, what a great presentation. I'm not going to be able to match that in terms of slides, but I'll try and uh, and answer your question, Catalina, and, and also make some, some points that hopefully Esther, Temi, and Tom can pick up as well. So in terms of the initial question, it's a huge challenge. It's the biggest uh, uh, distribution of vaccines across the planet that we've seen. And, and there's an urgency, as we see with the variants that are being reported in the UK, in South Africa, in Brazil, we cannot wait to watch and observe how the uh, virus mutates and, and, and changes. We've got to, we, we're in a, a race to maximize the number of people we immunize to build up that uh, immunity around the world before the, the, the virus changes and mutates. So it's, it's a huge challenge. And countries uh, like Rwanda and, uh, and Ghana that already have a drone uh, delivery system in place are much better adapted and in fact, Again, I'm not going to steal Esther's thunder, um, but already Rwanda is adapting how it's providing services, routine services, routine essential health services, but also COVID-related products like PPE. It, it's already adapting how it's doing that and how it's providing commodities to communities while maintaining social distances. And uh, drones are a huge part of that. Um, so I think the, 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 the key challenge that countries face is that it's very hard to introduce a new technology in a pandemic, but it, it, it is possible with some planning. And as I said, I think Rwanda, Ghana, um, and there are others, DRC, uh, Malawi, have already got a, a start on this, on this process. Um, in terms of the challenges, and maybe to ask, uh, address the question that you asked um, Tasha as well, drone delivery is here. Um, I don't have the numbers for, for Tom's wing copter, and I'll let him plug that. Um, reported 100,000 flights this week based on the work that was pioneered and led by Rwanda and now in Ghana, and they've started uh, DC operations in the US as well. So that those are 100,000 flights that involve the delivery of primary healthcare commodities, vaccines, um, you know, essential medicines, family planning, other medications that are needed in primary healthcare settings in parts of rural Rwanda and Ghana, as well as um, you know, urban centers as well. You know, the drone technology is transformative to pick up on a point that Tasha made, that countries like Rwanda and Ghana are achieving levels of service, levels of performance that are best in the world. It's not just a question of best in East Africa or best in West Africa. They are achieving levels of performance that are world champions. If there was a World Cup of primary healthcare delivery, Rwanda and Ghana would be the finalists battling it out to see which one has uh, claims the, you know, the prize. Uh, Rwanda would say that we've been there first and so maybe they get the prize. But the point is that the vision that the government had has allowed them to establish a level of service delivery, a level of fulfillment, a level of inventory management, which I think you know, many supply chain professionals around the world would be uh, jealous of to see how they're able to both maintain and understand what the demands are from the services uh, in, the, in remote clinics and how they're able to, to supply those. So the levels of those performance exist and, and they're being achieved. Um, 
but it needs the government leadership from Rwanda, from Ghana, from Ghana. You know, it, we see it in Sierra Leone, we see it in DRC, in Malawi as well, to achieve that. And donors like, you know, whether it be the Gates Foundation or bilateral donors or multilateral donors, need to be strategic in how they support the governments. They should certainly give the governments the lead. They must give the governments the, um, you know, support their leadership, but not come in with small test pilot projects that that are really just a proof of concept and then have no vision for what happens next. If you are going to start delivering COVID vaccines where you have a very short uh, shelf life, you have to maintain a, only a few hours outside of the ultra cold chain. Drones allow you to, with the speed of delivery that Tasha mentioned, with the ability to hold inventory at essentially respond to it just in time to the demand signal, drones really offer that possibility to do that. But to do that, you've got to have that government leadership and vision. And donors have to get behind that. And, and, and donors have two roles to play. One is there's a risky uh, initial investment piece where there's a proof of concept. And donors you know, have to support governments to actually test the technology, whether it's through the, um, the drone corridors in Malawi that UNICEF has set up, or it's, it's you know, making sure that, that there's a proper testing of safety and procurement um, that the government is doing. That has to be put in place because if governments are to make investment and they are to invest their tax dollars as Rwanda and Ghana are doing or to take loans from the World Bank and other multilaterals, they need to have a, a, a proof of, um, of, of efficacy, of safety, of, of, that the technology works. And of course, as Tasha was saying, that the cost, uh, cost uh, um, effectiveness works as well. So, um, you know, it's possible. It takes a lot of planning. Put the governments first. Um, donors get behind the governments, don't lead, but rather sit and support the leadership that exists in, in governments. And there are multiple partners. Tom will talk about Wincopter. Um, there are many others. Uh, we've mentioned Zipline, Swoop Hero. There are an increasing number of other uh, technical partners that are out there. Uh, governments have a greater uh, a choice. Um, and the World Bank certainly has a huge role to play uh, in terms of ensuring that the long-term funding that's needed is um, you know is available for governments to use, and then finally, um, and then a shout out to Temi. You know, it's governments should be in the lead. Governments should take uh, leadership, but sometimes you need energetic, innovative, uh, young, um, you know, entrepreneurs and innovators like Temi, who also sees an opportunity and and sees the possibility to provide a service or to provide. Uh, just in time service that we mentioned that um, you know to help the governments that uh, you know, that um, um, to help them achieve what we're trying to to achieve. So I've rattled on. I'll I'll pause there and hopefully we'll have time for further questions. Thank you so Thank much, you. David. And as as you say, we cannot speak about uh, high frequency drone services or drones at scale without speaking about Rwanda. So I'm very excited to have uh, with us Esther. Esther is the Director General for Innovation and Emerging Technologies at the Ministry of ICT in Rwanda. And um, many of you might not know this, but in 2019, Rwanda became the first country in the world where there were more autonomous drone flights than uh, man aviation flights, basically more drones than planes in the sky. So, uh, as David mentioned, there was this partnership with Zipline, and now um, actually 75% of the blood delivered in Rwanda is delivered by blood, by, by drones. So, uh, this is very exciting. So, Esther, thank you so much for being here, and I think the question in everyone's mind is, how did this happen? How did Rwanda become the global leader when it comes to uh, drone technology? And what should the world learn from Rwanda's experience? Thank you. Thank you, Catalina, and thank you, David, for really praising all our work uh, uh, before. So one of the things, if you look at Rwanda, we are a very tiny country, landlocked in the middle of the continent. And um, with our, con our context, and if you look at the whole country, Almost 70 people rely on agriculture as an economic activity. So, um, as a country, one of the strategies we have and we aspire to be, we want to be a knowledge led economy. And ICT and technology in general is one of those, um, is one of our biggest strategies on how we actually work that. So, with that, we've um, worked to become. Um, 
a proof of concept country where we provide an enabling um, environment in terms of the regulatory um, aspect and a testbed for innovation. And when we talk about innovation, really we are trying to be um, as open as possible to, to things no one else has tried, but we think are going to address some of the fundamental issues that we do have. So, um, and, and, and that's the background around why did we even entertain the idea of having drones in the, in the country? How do you even entertain such an idea that is, you already recognize that um, innovation is going to be fueling your economy. So where else other than trying to see what is relevant in your context and how can you adapt new innovation? So as everyone else has said, uh, Zipline was uh, the first, um, the first um, idea we tested, worked for us. And really the, the most challenging part from the government side was deciding um, if we're going into healthcare, what is the most impactful way to do this? And it's blood delivery. One, our country is, is, is a hilly country, so the terrain is not that, um, that it's not that, um, it's really obvious that there's infrastructure challenges along providing blood across the country and that Temi Wood has a really good uh, background and reason why that, that would be. And um, so with Zipline um, today, what we've tried, we, we've, what we did was answering how do we, um, integrate that into the normal airspace, um, inter also integrate that into the healthcare system. So it's integration within the systems, not to, to say that it's a, diff it's a system apart, but it's integration, integrating and changing accordingly as you go along. So, so today with, um, with that network, we have about, we're serving about 265 health facilities and Catalina, as we said, 80% of blood is delivered um, using drones um, and at the moment um, so zipline has been able to deliver about 18,000 blood units um, so far and uh, and then about 13,700 um, um, other medical products so this is really a win for us and something that we we, we want to 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 promote and that also uh, led us to think in a larger sense about putting together a drone policy so a drone policy to open up this industry in the country, how can we um, have, um, uh, how can we create this industry all together? And we created a drone policy to, to also address any other, um, some of the aspects that Tasha has been talking about, whether, what else can drones be used for? Um, and that drone policy has been around for, and is currently informing some of the actions that, that we are we're doing today. much Esther and uh, it's really a great story uh, the Rwanda zipline story uh, but now let's switch gears to another company I'm really happy to introduce one, another rising star in the drone ecosystem and this is uh, Wingcopter which uh, operates both in the commercial and the humanitarian space uh, Wingcopter is a German company and I'm very proud to say that they were one of the winners of the Lake Kivu challenge uh, under the Africa drone forum last year actually they won the emergency delivery category and they also got an award from their safety for their safety protocols um, and this is just one of many budgets that Wingcopter has accumulated over the past couple of years they're also one of the web 100 technology pioneers and uh, very and a fun fact is that uh, Wingcopter holds the world speed record uh, for drones so for you for those of you that are wondering what's the speed record for drones is 240 kilometers per hour so, uh, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. It's very exciting to have you here. And I just want to hear a little bit more about Wingcopter and uh, about your business model. How is it different from the uh, business models we heard before? And uh, I would also love to hear how are you positioning uh, Wingcopter to, um, to support uh, the global uh, COVID-19 uh, relief? Thank you. Sure. First of all, it's really a pleasure. And uh, thanks for the great uh, information up front from the other speakers. Um, yeah, we uh, end your introduction. So um, the business model of Wingcopter, um, we, we started uh, building a drone, which we wanted to, actually we wanted to combine two drone types in one. If I talk a little bit of technology and then um, merging into the business model itself um, and, and how we operate today. 
Um, but in 2012, we thought, can we combine two drone types in one so we can enable vertical takeoff without the need to build any infrastructure for, for like, for example, um, yeah, Zipline was mentioned, it's a catapult. It also makes sense in some ways, but we, we wanted to really have no infrastructure. So you just need the drone and then you can take off wherever you want. That was the initial idea, but still we wanted to have long range flights um, or with, with quite a good amount of payload. Right now we can fly beyond 100 kilometer of range with our drones and we can also carry up to six kilogram already, which then will exceed these specs. Uh, and for, for example, the, the range will increase. Um, we're also looking at a couple of other features I will maybe explain in a, in a minute. But um, the really idea, the, the core idea was how can we combine two drone types in one? Um, the, the idea was the tilt rotor technology, so we actually can tilt the rotors. You can see the wing copter here in the background. It also has wings, so it's not just a drone, as you know, but it's a yeah, combination of a wing system with the multi-copter. And uh, that actually worked pretty well in 2012. And the first business model we then had was, um, or the, the, the motivation we had was, can we improve supply chains? Can we, I, I for example, I'm not an engineer, but I, I was uh, lucky to do my social service in, uh, or to, to serve in Ghana um, for, for one year, um, working with kids in school and able to uh, learn a lot. It was a very great time, but also see the, the, the impact of uh, not, not that, great existing infrastructures in terms of like cool, ch cool chains and uh, generally um, yeah, experience how it is if medicals or me medical goods cannot be delivered that fast. And uh, coming back to Germany, experienced my co-founder who built this drone already, but the use case was, what, what can we really do? I, I had this hope to, to do something good with, with drone technology. Actually, we're not doing military stuff uh, until today by, by wish. We, we, we decided to really use that technology for good. So the first model, when you ask about the business model, was okay. We use that technology. We want to sell it for improving and saving lives. And, and the first thing is uh, improving supply chain. So it was basically an OEM selling drone technology to the ones who want to use these drones to improve their supply chains, to deliver faster from A to B, um, and to build out their logistical skills um, on the on the other next dimension uh, in the air. Uh, that was the beginning, but we it turned out into uh, or it turned out that many of our first clients or, or, or partners, I, I would say partners, uh, even until today, we are looking for the right partnerships. As this is teamwork always to improve supply chains. It's not just here you have the drone. That's it. It it requires a bit more, and we realized that we always went into the project either into implementation or uh, even setting up the full project. So we had we had a few partners which ask us to do everything, to, to train the people to or, or even bring pilots uh, to the project um, and, and maintain the drones, uh, fly the drones. So it, it became more and more into a full service model where we said, okay, you can also just, we find a, a, a price per month, some, some kind of a fee. Uh, we, we love long-term projects. Actually, we, had, we have done a lot of POCs. We have proved the technology in multiple occasions, but we, we are now looking at partnerships where we can I think the, the pandemic gives a good reason why we should expand these drone delivery networks, make them more sustainable together and, and build them up uh, in a way that they can last for long. And, and even post COVID times, it could be utilized in many other ways to deliver all kinds of urgently needed goods. So this is the partnerships we are looking forward right now. And here we would offer as the business model, that was the initial question, we would offer the full service um, or the drones, we do both. So you can either, if you say, no, no, I, I have pilots, I know how to operate drones, I just want to expand the range because I'm normally using multi-copters, you can add your, to your fleet wing copters uh, as they can make these long ranges and, and, and carry quite a good amount of payload on, on these um, distances. Or you say, I actually have, I have log logistical skills or I have certain goods like vaccines to, to be delivered faster, or I want them to be delivered faster, now I need someone who can help us with the service. And uh, then we come with the drones, with pilots, trained pilots, um, and also the, the knowledge how to get permissions, and we can help to set up the whole project. To make it fully sustainable, we started to work also with more and more local people. So what we what is our wish for sustainability is that we don't need to, sh uh, to send always the people from Germany, uh, rather that what we what we are doing even right now in the projects I will refer to a bit later when you have maybe a question towards our extra projects right now where we will deliver vaccines um, or already have de delivered vaccines we started to train locals um, on the drone on maintenance uh, assembly and hopefully in future we see that even productions our our full production could be in the countries we operate 
to not always have everything coming out of Germany. But uh, yeah, being able to build build this up worldwide. Yeah, that's a bit of the model, the technology. I mixed it all Thank up. You. Sorry. I hope that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'll, now let's switch gears. Uh, Temi, I cannot see you in the screen, but I hope you're with us uh, by audio. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Thank so let, oh, okay, great. Now I can see you. So, uh, Temi is the founder and CEO of LifeBank, and LifeBank is a Nigerian startup that uh, has a beautiful mission. I'm going to read it is to use its logistic network to ensure that no African dies because of lack of access to medical products. Um, LifeBank working towards that mission, it has saved more than 10,000 lives and has delivered more than 25,000 uh, health products in Nigeria. So congratulations. Uh, BBC has actually uh, named Temi one of the 100 women changing the world and is uh, a top African innovator by the World Economic Forum. So very excited to have you here with us uh, today, Temi. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, more about LifeBank? And I want to understand uh, from your perspective, the challenges of doing these deliveries on the ground. I'm also aware that uh, LifeBank is, uh, is um, a multimodal delivery system, uh, as it should be. So uh, the question for you is, uh, how do drones fit within this multi, uh, uh, multimodal network? And uh, what are the challenges of bringing them in? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Catalina, and thank you for your kind words, David, uh, Tom, we're happy to be your partner. Uh, thank you, Tasha, for all that training. I mean, I, I was just uh, blown away by all the information. And Esther, you know, a great fan. And, and uh, you know, I always say that um, I'm low-key Rwandan in my head. <laughs> uh, so it was it's lovely to hear from you. Uh, so. Uh, I think for us, we call ourselves the business of saving lives. We believe deeply in our power to innovate uh, for our people on the ground and save their lives. Um, you know, I, I always, anytime things get hard, you know, competition gets hard in the market, you know, I try to go back to a moment that I think has stayed with me uh, for all of my time with uh, working at LifeBank. And in that moment for us, it is simply this idea of a woman, you know, imagine a young woman, she's just delivered a baby, she's on a bed, she's bleeding out. And uh, she knows, and her healthcare worker knows that she has just a couple of hours to live, if she's lucky. Um, they've seen many, many women like this, so it's not even a, a significant emergency because it's something they're used, used to. And then a drone or a bike or a truck or a tricycle gets to the hospital, and there is the blood that she needs and it's delivered to her and she survives and she gets to hold her baby uh, and she gets to raise her child and for me i think that's what it's all about uh, we are a tech company but we're a tech company that is at our center uh impact uh focused we believe in the stories of the people we save every single day we remind ourselves when you enter life bank and hq uh, we have on our wall the names of everybody we've ever rescued and we are deeply immersed in the vision and in the um in the promise of what we do at life bank so how does drone fit into this we are we started with motorcycles uh we moved to tricycles and motor and trucks larger trucks small trucks uh boats uh, to deliver to river Rhine communities. And finally, uh, we enter the drone world, which is why we're here today. LightBank believes a couple of things, and I'll try to flesh it out uh, briefly. We believe that transportation, we believe inherently that transportation can rescue people and save lives and can drive impact. Uh, we are strongly, that is why we were created. We wanted to figure out a way to use a multimodal logistics system to rescue people on their worst day. We believe that a multimodal distribution system is most appropriate for our context, for the communities where we operate. We believe that technology should not take jobs. In fact, it should create it. We believe that we can create a high tech and deliver that high tech uh, product to our people in the last mile using low tech technologies like SMS, like USSD, so that they can engage with 
blockchain. They can engage with AI. They can engage with drone technology while not being uh, high tech themselves. So we believe deeply in water motor logistics. We believe in our riders, our driver, our riders. We get on a bike. We deliver in nights and days. We believe deeply in them, and we are really committed to the work. But we know that technology can help us get faster and smarter. In the past, we've used many, many different types of tech. We're actually secretly a tech company. Uh, the thing that people know most about us is our logistics, but we are at our hearts, at our core, a technology company. We've used blockchain to bring transparency and efficiency into the blood system. We've used AI to better figure out the match supply to demand. Um, and we believe that drone matches, you know, UAVs matches that, but that journey uh, that we've already been on to use interesting high tech, a new technology to help transform the supply chain in Africa. So for us, uh, for drones, the first thing we've done is we've built a system that allows us, that takes the decision on what tool we'll use to deliver this product, uh, to deliver this product uh, to the last mile. We built a, an intelligent data-based, data science-based uh, platform that can look at details around an order and figure out what is the best way of delivering this product. And often it comes down, it's a drone. Um, it can be a drone for many reasons. For us, it can be drones because it's the fastest way uh, and there is an emergency. So when you have 20 minutes to save a life, Perhaps a bike doesn't fit that context. So we have a technology that can tell us this is a drone delivery based on the parameters that the hospitals has given us. We believe that this decision is absolutely critical to reduce cost, to ensure speed, and get to the last mile. And also protect and save jobs. Uh, for us, we think this is the right path for our communities. We believe also in profitable, scalable systems that are localized, and that are built by local communities. We believe in young innovations, uh, young innovators in Africa. We are one, you know, we are, the company is a bunch of young people coming together to transform this environment. We believe in our ingenuity, in our um, speed. Uh, we have not been um, lucky to raise significant amount of capital, yet we've been able to deliver thousands and thousands of pints of blood, thousands of cylinders of oxygen, thousands of vials of vaccines, of medicines, and other critical supplies. So we really believe deeply in technology and will continue to do this work. Um, so it's my honor to be on this panel with all of you. Uh, Esther, Catalina, thank you for joining us, uh, for inviting me. Uh, Tasha, Tom, David, it's been my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Tammy. So we only have 15 minutes left. So what I'm going to do is kind of go around with a round of questions and I'm going to ask our panelists to just take one minute uh, to respond. Um, one minute, one minute and a half. So uh, Tasha, let's start with you. I, it was fascinating to see your presentation and uh, the, actually your point on 3D printing, I think is one that often uh, doesn't get uh, looked at it carefully. So I'm curious to hear more about how you're seeing the convergence of all these technologies, uh, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and what do you see would be the, um, the impact on the, on the healthcare uh, supply, supply chains? particularly now in co with COVID-19 pandemic? Is this an accelerator? How are you seeing all this thing uh, happening together? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I love that you use the word uh, convergence. We, we talk about that um, at, at our quite a bit. What we're seeing, um, you know, an, an amazing period of convergence really across technology platforms, um, whether it be, you know, AI in, in any industry, um, energy storage across industries. Um, I, I really, I, I like that example here because um, I think that artificial intelligence is not only, you know, making drone delivery possible and and inexpensive and, uh, you know, helping the logistics of it actually happen and deliver things faster. Um, but for manufacturing, it's also, you know, I talked about 3D printing enables you to create parts that weren't previously possible to manufacture. Well, AI helps um, create designs that humans could have never imagined. So you get these parts that are perfectly designed for what they're supposed to do, and they're they're super optimized. And drones is such an exciting industry because it's 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 still um, you know in its early days where you actually get the opportunity to think 
you know, ground up manufacturing, what do I want my vehicle to look like? And you can actually utilize AI um, in the design, you know, versus say an old traditional manufacturer where it's a bit harder to start from scratch. You, you get the opportunity to do that from, from the ground up. Um, and, you know, to the second part of your question on COVID, uh, we, we do see an extreme acceleration. Um, you know, innovation uh, takes share during tumultuous times. We say that a lot. We saw that in 3D printing um, because, you know, we, we had no other option. We needed parts fast and we needed them manufactured now. We saw that in drone technology, we saw a lot of regulators become a lot more amenable to allowing for the testing that needs to take place for that development work um, to, to actually get these, these platforms, you know, tested and up and running. Um, and that happened not just, you know, it's, it's, it's been accelerated in, in places like Africa, but also the US, which had traditionally been a lot more resistant in terms of allowing these technologies to fly. So it, it's really a global phenomenon. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's here to stay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I want to take you back to 2015 when Gates Foundation invested in Zipline. And at the <laughs> time, it was a very small company and actually haven't even set foot in Africa. So I, I, I want to reflect a little bit on, on, on the thinking at the time and uh, have your vision uh, realized. What have you learned in this uh, five years now that Zipline is a $1.3 billion uh, unicorn? Um, so full disclosure, um, this is a joke. I wish I had invested in them before they were a unicorn, though I, that would have been a conflict of interest. Um, I, I basically learned that there was an inspiration and there was a vision of what was possible, but it's been a hard journey. And it took the leadership, frankly, of the president and the minister of health in Rwanda to give them the start and to realize that vision. And we joked at the time, um, particularly as the Black Panther movie was coming out, that actually Zipline was an embodiment and Rwanda was an embodiment of Wakanda, of Africa leading with the application of best in class first world technology and the rest of the world learning from their experience. And so we saw a vision we took a risk, obviously, as a foundation, we could take these risks. Um, but ultimately, it came down to the hard work of, uh, you know, the vision of the ministry, the hard work of Zipline. And frankly, we invested in them to implement in Tanzania. That implementation didn't work out for a myriad of reasons. And we can take that offline as to uh, the reasons for that. But essentially, it reinforces, and what we've learned is, and I, I stressed it, this must be government led, it must be government owned, government must be in charge and donors must facilitate that rather than imposing a solution. Um, because if the vision is not there, it's not going, you're not going to realize the potential. Speaking about vision, uh, we happened to last year in Rwanda hold the first African Drone Forum and the Lake Kivu Challenge. And we were very lucky to have President Kagame actually open the forum. And he gave us this quote that said, why limit ourselves to just using drones? We can also design and manufacture drones in Africa and help create new industries that generate employment and prosperity. So Esther, I, I think the question in everyone's mind is now that Rwanda has uh, set this massive milestone of, of having a countrywide delivery network by drones, what's next for Rwanda when it comes to the drone ecosystem? Um, thank you. I think, I think our next action are really embodied in that, um, in that court. And um, from the government side, one of the things that, um, that we are hardly working on is, is setting up a drone operations center. Um, and, and, and this center would um, be a best for creating a drone industry. So that create accelerators um, and co-working spaces for innovators in the, in the space. Um, also um, supporting the handling of licensing um, and other registration that is needed that is currently carried out by the 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 Rwanda civil aviation so um, so this is one of the biggest projects that we have and we are really pushing to get this uh, off ground um, and and there's and, and there's great strides in that and we believe um, it would be a, a very good best for for a drone industry not only in Rwanda but um, in the region and how we can continue to, to help startups and innovators continue to test their, their, their innovations. But in terms of diversifying how um, the applications of drones, um, we have one other drone company that is called Caris, 
um, that John Farm might have met them. Um, one of the interesting um, areas they're also applying in, one is in uh, agriculture, where they, they, they're they into spraying um, pesticide or fertilizers, um, survey, surveys of, of, of land um, and, and any other, and, and crop uh, monitoring um, evaluation. So these are some of the areas that um, that they're going into. And uh, another interesting one that they've actually tested last year during the pandemic was uh, in malaria, where they, um, you know, they, they, um, they did a bit of research and a pilot around uh, spraying um, um, mosquitoes in swamps, yeah. which is one of the areas where malaria really grows and, 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 and people uh, get malaria. So some of the, the results are really impressive at the moment. And um, and we look forward to see how that is going to scale because um, it, it is a med precision medicine uh, prevention at, at at its core, yeah. and um, they're also studying a manufacturing a manufacturing part. So uh, and, and they've already started manufacturing, which, as I said at the start, um, our action are really embodied in that in that quarter of sense. We're going to manufacture, but also um, testing and deploying um, other areas of, um, of implementation and seeing great results in that. Excellent. Thank you so much, Esther. And uh, we heard about Rwanda. Now, Tom, uh, you are also working in other countries uh, in Africa and in South Asia. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, uh, how is this uh, German company integrating into the local ecosystem? Uh, I'm curious to know uh, what does it take to ab adapt and be able to work well together? Because a uh, foreign company cannot do things on their, no on their own. They have to work within the local ecosystem. So I'm curious to hear more about that. In one in one or two minutes, you're on mute. I think. Good thing. So, um, as actually, it's it's not just have to, but we really want to work uh, integrated into, or we want to integrate our drones into in the uh, local um, uh, infrastructure, or basically into the. Um, um, health health supply chain. Uh, so we don't want to bring something strange new to it. So we, we really want to uh, cr create a, a really good match. And therefore, it needs to be a, a collaboration, or it, it should be a collaboration with uh, everyone on ground, with, with, with which is trying to set up education uh, programs. We are right now. We have partnered with UNICEF on this topic. Um, there's a drone drone and data academy already in in Malawi. Now we uh, join forces to. Um, and then luckily funded also by the German government that we can create special classes also on, in addition to the uh, education program of the Drone and Data Academy by UNICEF, we can on top train people on how to use wing copters. And then either they can start their own businesses with uh, working like on these drones, knowing how to use them. And uh, we, we will make sure that there, there are ways that they can access also wing copter drones. So there will be different people um, with low budgets can also use these drones. So we want to enable this. Uh, at the same time, they can also join and help us building up this new infrastructure. So building really drone hubs, centralized hubs, which which serve multiple smaller hubs. And um, right now, with the COVID, um, like uh, with the pandemic ongoing, and the the chance to help really or to speed up the deliveries of the vaccines, we we send a team. Now also trained uh, um, in addition locals, as I just pointed out that this is extremely important and together we now start to prepare to deliver actual COVID-19 vaccines uh, in Malawi. At the same time we set up in Southeast Asia and in a country which we will announce it pretty soon with uh, also partners here and this is again the key. Partnerships are the key to enable this uh, and we are looking for more and more partnerships as we are an independent drone uh, manufacturer and service provider so we are not tied to anyone but we are happy to partner up and really join forces to, to enable these networks to grow faster and more sustainable and reliable. And yeah, on the drones, uh, maybe last thing, what I said, apart from teamwork, uh, training, like education and partnership, it's also the drone type itself. I pointed out the vertical takeoff and long range fly uh, capability due to the tilt rotor technology. What we are now doing is we are building a next generation after now. We are soon releasing, and this is, I think, perfect timing with the drone, uh, with the 
COVID vaccine delivery, we will release a drone specifically made for drone delivery. So it has uh, at some point economies of scale because we are ramping up right now production, building a facility on roughly 6,000 square meter just behind me um, where we can manufacture thousands of units. Uh, that will change the yeah, economy of scale and it will be able to drop multiple packages on the flight so you can really and also being controlled one to many so one pilot controls many drones at the same time that's the new software we are right now uh, creating yeah. and the algorithm will, will allow this so, yeah Thanks. this all together will be pretty game changing great okay. tom so only one really last question, over, yeah. I think, given the time, but uh, Temi, um, your company has been all hands on deck in supporting COVID-19 efforts from everything from uh, delivering oxygen uh, to creating an inventory of ventilators, uh, setting up a, a test facility, so congratulations. My question for you is, what do you think is the legacy of uh, COVID-19 on supply chains uh, of medical product and medical services uh, in, in in countries like Nigeria, um, if you can expand a little bit on that and how do you see all these pieces working together, uh, technology, donors, uh, governments, uh, regulators, etc. Thank you. And you have two minutes and, uh, and I think with that we will have to close. Um, thank you. That's a great question. I think what COVID-19 has shown us uh, is the need for resilient health system um, and localization of critical parts of the health system. Uh, you know, it's hard to travel when there's a shutdown, and, you know, and it's hard to you know, ship things from all over the world when there's a shutdown. And it's hard. your pilots are not, you know, local pilots. You know, it's hard when people have to go home because there's a pandemic. It's really difficult. So I think what this pandemic has really taught us is the importance of localization and resilience. Uh, the way that I define resilience is profitability, scalable systems um, that can really stand shocks. Uh, and I think for us, that's what we've learned. And we continue to build a business that can be resilient and that can partner with everybody. Uh, for us, we see ourselves partnering with governments, um, you know, in places like Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Nigeria here. Uh, we see ourselves partnering with international organizations like maybe the Gates Foundation uh, and partnering with, you know, companies like, you know, I mean, sorry, countries like Rwanda, you know, and partnering with, you know, folks like uh, Tom at Wingcopter. You know, we actually fly Wingcopter wing drones. Uh, so for us, we think that partnership is critical, particularly when there's a shock like COVID-19. And it is really important that we don't go back to the way things are and continue to, to make progress based on what COVID-19 has shown us by building resilient and scalable um, supply chain systems for health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Temi. And unfortunately, we couldn't cover all the topics that I wanted. We didn't spoke so much about regulations, and uh, we know this is a critical enabler. We just finished a scan of drone regulations in Africa, and we found out that only 30% of the countries actually have regulation in place, and 50% of the countries don't have anything. So I think this is also a call for all the decision makers that are uh, sitting in this chat, to in the in the in this panel or in this presentation, to uh, to work together. I think. The, the theme of this uh, panel, like in the US, has been about unity uh, and about partnerships and about working together to uh, not just do a little pilot uh, here and there, but actually work uh, together toward uh, strengthening the ecosystem and, and, and making sure that um, that uh, drones can be a part of uh, helping the, the, the world in, the, in solving this pandemic and beyond that uh, in solving many of the challenges in health supply chains. So thank you very much to our panelists. Dave David, Esther, Tom, Temi, Tasha, you've been all great. And uh, I'm very excited that we continue this conversation offline because, uh, yeah, you have so many interesting experiences and, uh, and ideas to share. Thank you so much.